Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. So, is the Stanford president guilty or not? After seven years at the helm, President Mark Tessier Levine says he'll resign despite an independent panel's report clearing him of research misconduct. Is he a fraudster that's had like this string of really suspicious steps in his career that led him and catapulted him to be the president of Stanford University since 2016? Or is all of this just some kind of misunderstanding that has blown out of proportion that led to him not being able to do his job properly? You might have heard on the news, yes, that Stanford University's president has to resign over these questions and allegations and an investigation that happened into whether he faked his experiments, whether he purposely made discoveries that couldn't exist, and whether he knew about it or did not know about it. On the surface, yes, this thing comes straight out of a K-drama because what it does, it allows... Stanford University, so to give you the answer and then working back, the investigation that was like went on for like eight months found that he's not guilty of direct fraud. He didn't know that this stuff was happening. And yes, there were things that he could have done to retract the papers that he knew had miscalculations or misrepresentations. It's not just a question about being wrong. You can be wrong, but you can't put out there that something happened in a discovery with like, you know, these cells and stuff that actually can't exist in the real world. So that in and of itself, I think it's being a little bit glossed over because this is a complex issue. But if you really kind of want to see like, you know, which direction, it's not about being wrong. Everybody can be wrong about a thing that they did find or uh, basically a conclusion for something that they found and maybe they were wrong about like what it meant. But you can't make up stuff that doesn't exist. You can't publish a paper saying like gravity moves up. When, you know, you can be maybe wrong about how fast gravity works or whatever those uh, physics equations are. But if you found that, yes, it goes down and then, you know, maybe you're wrong about some certain areas. I think people are forgiving about that. But you can't publish something saying like, oh, my God, gravity goes up and I, that's, I'm the first person to find that. And then, you know, then start to go on the fast track of your career because everybody thinks you're a genius and you're going to win the Nobel Prize, which is essentially what is like happening here. So August 31st will be the last day for the Stanford University president, and he's going to resign, then become a professor again in biology. But what happened, and how did we get to this point? A freshman? You can't even call him a freshman. The dude literally graduated high school last year. All of this has changed within like less than a year. It hasn't even been 12 months months. So at this point in the summer, it's hot. This kid is on the East Coast and he's about to enter Stanford as a freshman. He's probably just buying, you know, stuff for his dorm and figuring out how to navigate campus. He gets onto campus in September and somebody gives him a tip. I don't know who that somebody was, but you got to always be, you know, those somebodies they may have an agenda, but he totally did not have any agenda. He just joined the Stanford Daily, which is the school newspaper. His parents, though, are like reporters for New York Times and New Yorkers. So, you know, he, he, he comes from that uh, environment, which I think gave his reporting a lot more credibility because you know that he can at, he can always check in with mom and dad about like you know if he, is he doing this right is this 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 stuff did not read like you can I'll put the links to the Stanford Daily all of his articles it is TLDR which is why we're doing this video but if you want to read it it does not read like a high school kids 
articles. It reads like it could be in the New York Times. And he basically got a tip in September. He investigated, published in November. Look, he barely even started classes, right? His first quarter at Stanford. And in November, like he published and then on the same day or the next day, the university got so shook up that they launched an investigation on their own president. Now, is that kind of like a thing where it's like not that big of a deal? This seemed like a big deal. What was the issue at hand? And who is the president? Why was this kind of like this thing? Well, the president essentially comes from academia. So he was a researcher, scientist, professor, and then also worked for uh, biotech firms like Genentech. And he essentially was looking at the brain and possibly finding a cure or at least the pathways where you can start making new drugs to fight Alzheimer's. You know, at that time, you know, even now, but especially I think in the mid 2010s or in 2000, you know, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, like everything is about Alzheimer's. And essentially he published a paper in 2009 that if it had been correct and true, then he would have won the Nobel Prize. Like everybody's saying like somebody would have won, like he would have won the Nobel Prize for sure for that discovery. It was so monumental. However, it didn't work. It it was not like something like you tried to make happen. It didn't work. It physically cannot scientifically exist what he said in the paper's conclusion. And that was the biggest one out of all of the examples, but they did investigations. They were looking at 12 papers that had real sus things, five in particular, including the 2009, which were really sus. And things just didn't seem like they were adding up. The investigation really ramped up. At first, it was a little shady because the investigation had like, you know, somebody's like almost like a friend of the president or even more shady than that is that they had money commingled in some kind of like investment. And then they hired a law firm to oversee it. Super like prestigious kind of committee of people from like Harvard and all over the place. And then they got like this crisis communications uh, PR firm that's like top notch Edelman to handle it. So this was on a big scale more than like oh well this is kind of like a misunderstanding it's this you don't you don't you don't push and fire all these buttons uh, to launch this kind of thing unless it is uh super serious but you wouldn't think it was super serious based on the top line the headlines that came from the report but if you dig deeper it looks a little messy So where did this tip come from? Essentially, there's been chatter online and it really heated up around 2016 on this thing called PubPeer. Even though there was chatter, you know, within people who kind of knew and were close to it, like for years, because he's been publishing uh, papers like 1999, 2001, 2004, 2003, and 2009, 2000, um, and then... Yeah, to, yeah, 2009, that was the big one. And in 2016, there was a lot more chatter on this thing called PubPeer, which I guess is like a Reddit for like uh, academics who can comment and make accusations about like, that looks shady, this looks fake. Like they all kind of talk about their, and in a way that seems like a great community to kind of, you know, keep the, integrity of the scientific community in check so people aren't like tempted to keep cheating or like you know making stuff up and they were saying like this stuff looks really made up and it started off with like the photo uh evidence of the conclusions that he made and people were like that looks totally photoshopped or this looks like this so what this reporter did this freshman 
and it, and it kind of looks like he probably asked mom and dad for like a really good reference because he got like a super reference and you know somebody who also does investigations in terms of biology and science misconduct for the New York Times and the New Yorker, which happened to be, yeah, where his parents work. But I'm just, you know, surmising. But to, to, to also emphasize that he got a good, good source. And so her name was Elizabeth Bick. And she basically went through all of the tips and stuff and she analyzed and she created the foundation of the first report and analysis that came out in November of 2022 and she was saying that there appear to be a lot of visible errors in these papers duplications of these images that are suggestive of an intent to mislead so you know they're always like couching their words like trying to basically say like this looks super shady it looks like it would be you know they'd be guilty but i can't you know definitely say you know if i if i don't see you know we don't have video of a mouse in you know the stanford president's hand like going over photoshop and you know doing things you know you can't really say that and she also did say that the response that they got from the president at the time saying like, oh, yeah, there might have been errors, but it doesn't change the conclusions of my paper. That's why, you know, we're not doing anything about it. I'm not retracting it. Whereas later, it turns out definitely he knew that actually the findings cannot, you cannot say gravity goes up. Like you can, he could not say the uh, fe- the conclusions of the paper with the amount of misrepresentation of the data. So the investigation in its more harsh terms said that the quality of research at the Stanford president's labs when he was doing all of this fell below accepted scientific practices. And it also said that he fostered a culture of rewarding the winners, like essentially rewarding the underlings, the research assistants who would create too good to be true results and really make heart sound like bullying of the ones that wouldn't play along with this kind of thing. That starts to then give me those vibes of, you know, Yonsei University, remember like that grad student, you know, made a homemade bomb because he was so mad at his professor and then like put it in a paper bag or something and like, like put it out in his office, like during office hours or something like that. Like the abuse of the people under you. Now you're probably wondering like, what, well, what is the science? And you know, if you don't want to listen to the science part, you know, you could skip over this, but I'm going to try to do it in the most layman terms as possible and only focus on the 2009 paper, which was the one that was supposed to be like, oh my God, he's going to win the Nobel prize for curing Alzheimer's. Now, the reason why this is so shocking to the scientific community, like I said, it's something that could not exist. However, it was kind of close. So essentially, the Stanford president said that he discovered that there is this precursor protein called NAPP, N-A-P-P, and it binds to this receptor called DR6, death receptor 6. And that causes your brain to degrade. That causes like the damage to your brain for Alzheimer's. And the theory was, is that this is a natural process. Your brain is always cleansing itself. And so it has to kind of, you know, uh, clear out the dead cells. But during Alzheimer's, that the theory is, is that that goes into hyperdrive and like the brain is kind of like eating itself or something like that. So if you can find out that mechanism to stop the brain from like, eating itself, then you can start to create like blockers or drugs that would uh, interrupt that process. And he said that it was N app that bound to DR6. So he's saying like, okay, that's, that's what I found. That's what I discovered. However, in 2015, so six years later, somebody else found out that actually it wasn't NAPP. It was APP the complete, not the precursor, but the complete protein that binds to DR6 at a specific location. They even isolated it to E2 site. 
So essentially, they found the key that went into the lock, whereas the research from the Stanford president is almost as if like they're like, okay, well, this keychain uh, goes into the lock or into the door. They didn't even like um, isolate where it was. So if you're making that metaphor, it's kind of like, well, you know, a keychain can never open a door. Like it, it never, it doesn't go into the keyhole. And how did you say that, you know, before in your research, you found evidence that the like a keychain would go into a keyhole? How can you say that NAPP binds to DR6 when it wasn't that at all? Maybe you were kind of close. APP binds to DR6. And if it did bind, you should have known and you should have said it was at E2, which you never mentioned because you probably never found it. And so that is the thing that I think that when you're talking about the scientific community and then the reporting that this freshman did, I think he was really lucky by focusing on the science first, which is probably why we didn't hear so much about it because it was so nerdy, but that crowd at Stanford, the ones that would create the biggest uproar and prompt an investigation are the academics and they would need a very, very thorough, like the way that this freshman reporter did, a very thorough look into the evidence the data the science and like have some and have like the expert look at it that they can trust so he did all of the right things that i think activated and engaged stanford's core community of the researchers and they are the ones that bring stanford the money and the prestige when you say it's a research institute research university versus a teaching university that university focuses more on discovery and so the professors they may not be able to teach worth a darn which i've had a lot of them i'm like you can't teach your way out of paper bag because they are focused on the research and bringing these new discoveries to light and those if you lose those people they're not on board you don't have a university. So I think that also prompted Stanford to take this very seriously, very quickly, because they probably heard immediately these academics, they can look at it. They can tell whether there's really fire among a lot of smoke. We might be like, oh, there's not always fire where there's smoke. You know, we're just the normal people. But they know. They can see like, mm, no, uh, honest person doesn't do things in that way. And that looks super sus. So did this happen while he was a professor at Stanford? That was a very important question to me, at least, to see, like, is this an environment of shadiness at Stanford or not? And at least from the timeline that I was able to suss out, he did not do all this. He was not able to do this while he was a professor at Stanford. Officially, 2001 to 2005 is when he was a professor at Stanford, but really he was there from 2001 to 2003. He left for Genentech at 2003, and he was on leave until 2005. So during that period of time, he did not publish any papers uh, that that were you know suspicious he did publish suspicious papers in 1999 and 2001 now if they were suspicious because they probably had too good to be true results is that what got him to advance his career and be able to become a stanford professor that's the thing that where that's where it gets to be a real problem because if you fake your way and move your way up the food chain People get really pissed off about that. And so 2001 is when he entered Stanford. And then apparently he, at 2001, a colleague, because 
colleagues are always up on your business or also in the way that academia works is that like hey this is a really fancy paper that a lot of people are respecting and they use it to cite you know if that's one of the metrics in uh, if you're like a you know good professor is like how many people are quoting your work as a basis of like okay well this person discovered this and that's how I am basing and now I am you know building upon this research that's the problem if you're building upon fake research then the next thing you know everything becomes adulterated and people don't like that and so somebody in 2001 brought it up to his attention they're like you know your thing you know your 2001 paper your 1999 paper there's something a little bit wrong with it and you know i like to follow timelines and like you know kind of see a suggestion of what happened you know, from the timeline evidence. And then so why would you take a sudden leave of absence in 2003? You couldn't say like, oh, well, it's a too good to be off, uh, too, you know, too good to pass down offer, you know, work at Genentech, you know, in the private sector. But he had started his career as an academic, 1991 to 2001. He was like at UCSF and then he moved his way up to Stanford. And during that time in the 90s, he was the first to identify the molecule required for guiding axons, the strands which connect neurons in the brain, opening up a new field of research. That's the type of people that Stanford want. When you open up new fields of research, so there is this intense pressure to discover something groundbreaking. And if you can't, you can't. And if you still want to but can't and then you fake it, well, I guess this is a good case of perhaps it suggests that there was an intention to fake it till you make it. And perhaps he felt under the pressure of having to replicate that kind of success. And then in 1999, 2001, some like, so it looked like he kind of got away with it. And then he entered Stanford. And I kind of get the impression that he wasn't able to get away with it there. What I would really like to know, to cross-reference, you know, back-channel forensics, is who were these people who brought it to his attention? Who pissed him off in 2001 to 2003? And were they still at Stanford? in 2016 when he became the Stanford president and did they mysteriously get sidelined, punished, have their funding cut, promotions denied? I wonder. And so 2001 to 2003, he was at Stanford. 2003 then to 2011, he was at that really prestigious biotech company, Genentech. And is it all worth it though to do this kind of fraud because some people are saying like oh my god oh he he, he was accused of, of something and then he had to resign oh did he steal money no he didn't however does it translate into money oh yeah you better believe it does and this is the way to do the you know you don't directly steal research funds and then you know put it in your pocket or something that'd be that's just apparent at this level that's dumb what you can do is maybe take the research money fake it till you make it or just fake it and ride the success of this too good to be true discovery into positions of higher power and earning potential i had no idea it was like this much but basically it was like he was getting paid like over a million dollars, $1.5 million for many, many years in different positions like at Genentech, at uh, Rockefeller University as the president. He was like the ninth highest paid university president in the country. And then at Stanford, also very high salary. And so is it worth it, I guess? Yeah, if you're kind of like this starving, you know, PhD academic, I guess this is the type of you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that people are looking towards. Like, but it only goes to people who make these groundbreaking discoveries that open the door for a new field of research. And if you've ever kind of seen academics just like kind of crazy, like intense, that's what they're trying to go after in, I guess, a short period of time. 
So while he was at Genentech, which kind of makes me think that like perhaps it was easier to kind of do this kind of shenanigans over at a company versus the academic world when you get to the level of Stanford. So thank goodness. So in co- yeah, in conclusion, I think it looks like Stanford was able to protect its a- academic integrity because he didn't do this kind of stuff while he was at Stanford. But then right after, like right before, then right after, over at Genentech, in 2009, he made this publication that apparently, like when he presented it to the Genentech board, they were like, oh, like everybody was like shocked. They were like, this is going to win the Nobel Prize. And this, well, they're, they're a for-profit company. So they're just like, we can make so many drugs out of this. And apparently they started the campaign to design new medications around it but then very quickly very quickly they found like wait a minute this kind of doesn't work part of this whole thing about the scientific process that we give so much power to but if we're going to give so much you know more resources to scientists rather than like artists and thinkers part of the deal is that whatever you discover has to be replicatable in other laboratory so basically essentially to prove that it will always work and even at genentech when they were trying to reproduce the results of this experiment they couldn't and then by 2011 it was extremely clear there look there were like a lot of internal like turmoil going on about like oh we got to stop this project we got to move this project and they even hired people like a consulting firm or something to come in and do like training sessions on why you shouldn't fake your research and people are like oh well we don't know exactly why we're doing this right you know at this time but we have our suspicions so 2011 he leaves Genentech and then becomes like the president of Rockefeller University to oversee all of the uh, research labs there I should mention at Genentech, though, like right after he, you know, uh, made this 2009 discovery, he was immediately promoted to be like the chief scientific officer. So that's like the C-suite, you know, like with the CEO, CFO, like boom, and then big salary, boom. And then within two years or less than that, he, he's, I mean, this starts to show like, mm, it's kind of a, Something, something's a little bit too slick and too savvy about this. Now suddenly you're the president of this other university. You're kind of like, kind of escaping this really messy situation. So let's go back to that investigation, the final report, which I'll put a PDF of on soullight.tv so that you can see it for yourself. But they concluded that there was no evidence that he himself manipulated the data in the papers reviewed nor knew about it at the time. But the report also said this dude did not give us an adequate explanation as to why he didn't correct the scientific record. Why don't you do it? Of course, that's horrible. That that still sink your career. Like you think he was gonna would able to be like, you know, leapfrog from like from a retracted paper to then be like a star scientist and then the chief scientific officer of the one of the best biotech companies in the world and then become a president of a university and then president of Stanford University if you had to have a string of retracted papers of his most important discoveries. So I could see how people who then are on the inside in the academic world, they're probably the ones that kind of really, you know, gave the tips, pushed it because they're just pissed off. Like how how could this how could this type of person become the president of Stanford University? They're probably like, you know, really heated up on that. So yes, there were mis- there were mistakes in these. And then on top of that, it's like, hmm, but this doesn't look like an innocent mistake. It looks like an intent to mislead. That's the problem here. Not being wrong, not being off, but intending to mislead. So did he try at least to make some amends? It apparently seems that some people who were interviewed said that, yes, he 
did other experiments after 2009 that then modified what was concluded in the 2009 paper. So basically to say like the 2009 paper, that's not what you know actually happens, this actually happens. But you never fixed or retracted that 2009 paper. That's still like, you can still cite it. You know, you can still be like, well, this is still published. You know, this by some famous guys, Stanford president. You know, this must be true. But nobody now would base their new research on those findings because it's wrong. And then your stuff is going to be wrong. And apparently he did it in that way. The university spokesperson did say that in 2015, he did alert to journals about some problems when he got the message, but it wasn't very clear, like, you know, what did he do? What did it say? Because there's no evidence of it being corrected. So that's the problem. Like, there's there's kind of, like, these indications saying, like, oh, well, I, I, I did kind of contact them, or I did, you know, mention it, but the end result was it didn't get removed from the scientific community as fact. It's still in there as if it is fact. And apparently there's like some other part of the investigation that showed like, oh, he had a habit of like like drafting emails, but only sending portions of it to the people like at these institutions when he's supposed to fix the problem that starts to sound like oh yeah i did write an email but then he like only put it in his draft folder you know but he said like i wrote the email <laughs> or something it starts to get a little bit shady like once you start like uh talking in those types of words what did he say to give him his own you know uh, space for some of his words. He says, I'm gratified that the pl panel concluded I did not engage in any fraud or falsification of scientific data. The panel's review also identified instances of manipulation of research data by others in my lab. In the 32 years I've headed a research laboratory, I've published 74 papers of which I am the principal author and over 150 of which I am a non-principal author. So I don't trust this because it, he like cherry picked the report and just makes him look like he's totally innocent. If he's totally innocent, he would not be resigning. That's the thing. That's the biggest thing. And then also the standards of research had been violated according to Stanford's own standards. Now in he part of his excuses was that like well you know like i wasn't the only one on this uh paper uh there were other people but at stanford at that level and the way that they agreed to be as a community if you are a principal author on a paper you you got to take responsibility like let's say like honestly your research assistant did mess up you have to take uh, ownership of that because you are the lead on the paper. That's how, that's the integrity that clause that they have uh, decided to abide by at Stanford. If you, you know, if you're going to take the credit, you take the blame as well. But he didn't do this while he was at Stanford. So that was also kind of a question of like whether the same uh, ethics would apply to him that he imposes upon his professors and academics and researchers at his own school, but he, he didn't do this research while he was at Stanford. So then I guess that kind of gave the committee a way out to say like, oh, well, he didn't violate this thing because he didn't do it, you know, like while he was at Stanford. But that seems even more shady because <laughs> He's demanding that of the uh, the people that work for him. But thank goodness that Stanford had the ability to police itself, investigate itself, discipline itself, and it looked like it had safeguards in place where he wasn't able to do some of the most egregious things while he was active at Stanford. It just like was like before and after, and then him his being selected as the president that's prob that's a different issue that is an issue but at least the research integrity at least from this case that we can see 
it makes me uh, more relieved that uh, at, that you can probably trust the research that comes out of Stanford. All right, guys. Well, what do you think? Put your comments below. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.